Brahmatanam Brahmahavir Brahmagno Brahmanahutam Brahmaevate Nagantavyam Brahma Kama Samadina Haryom Tatsat The all pervading spiritual reality is in the ritual. The all-pervading spiritual reality is in the offering. The all-pervading spiritual reality is in he who offers to the digestive fire and all other offerings in which thou, which art all-pervading, dwell. Seeing that ineffable, self-existent, all-pervading, existence in every action, one lives in that. Peace, peace, peace unto all. Good morning. The, uh, the topic today is remembering Swami Brahmananda. And um, I hadn't planned to say that shloka from the 24th the 24th verse of the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita it just came out and it's actually all about Brahman. So, <laughs> so this is um, Swami Brahmananda's um, 161st birth anniversary today uh, actually today is his uh, the observance and um, it's our custom to remember him uh, on uh, or near his birthday on the nearest Sunday lecture. So that's what we're doing this morning. So most of you are familiar with the life of Swami Brahmananda. So I'll give only a brief uh, sketch of his early life and then focus on the remembrances of those who knew him. He was born Rakal Chandra Ghosh in January of 1863 in a village about 36 miles from Calcutta and lived 60 years until 1922. He was a handsome, energetic young boy, good at sports, gardening, and fishing. His early academic career was excellent. Later on, it went south <laughs> because his interest went uh, elsewhere. It went to higher things. But he continued, actually, I mean, this is a little out of sequence, but he continued to be a student uh, all his life. It's just that he, he, he didn't uh, do higher education or formal academic study. But his um, life was such that uh, wherever he went, he attracted uh, extremely talented and capable people. They would come to see him. And he educated himself through conversation. He would ask someone that was in charge of the horticultural uh, activities in Bengal or uh, some South Indian state about specific plants and what kind of environments they could live in and, and get all the information he needed. And he'd remember everything that he saw or heard uh, that he was paying attention to. He had to see it or hear it first, but then he'd remember it. And he'd take plants as well. That, 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 that South Indian tree, is, that's going to grow in Bengal. So he'd say, can you send some up there to Bellarmont? And he'd take things from Bengal, and he'd send them to the south. And he'd do this to enrich the, 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 the cultural interface in the whole country. Uh, but it wasn't just on horticulture or gardening. As whatever kind of expertise someone came to him with, he'd engage them in conversation if there was something that he wanted to know. So uh, it wasn't that he wasn't uneducated. He was 
amazingly educated, but not in a traditional way. Now I'll go back to his boyhood. <laughs> he was fond of devotional singing. When the village minstrel would sing kirtan, he would listen with rapt attention. As a young boy, he would practice meditation in the Kali temple. And during the Durga Puja, he would sit right behind the priest performing the worship and meditate like a yogi, unmoving. From his childhood, Rakal was quiet by nature and deeply religious. Meanwhile, at Dakshinaswara, Sri Ramakrishna would go up to the roof and at night and pray for pure-hearted young people with deep love of God who could stay with him and imbibe his teachings in a completely, uh, with, without reservation, some, some people with whom he could feel totally comfortable. He had a vision, Ramakrishna had a vision, and he expressed it. Just a few days before Rakal came for the first time, I saw the Divine Mother putting a child into my lap, saying, this is your son. I shuddered. Taken by surprise, I said, what do you mean? I have a son? She explained with a smile, this will be your spiritual son, and I was comforted. Sometime in the middle of 1881, Sri Ramakrishna had another vision. He saw two young boys dancing on a full-blown lotus floating in the Ganga. One of the boys he recognized was Sri Krishna, and the other was the same boy whom the Divine Mother had previously placed on his lap. That very day, Rakal, crossing the Ganges, came to Dakshinaswar from Konagar, and the master, immediately recognized him as his spiritual son. Sri Ramakrishna's assessment, he said, Rakal has the keen intelligence of a monarch. He could rule a kingdom if he wished. In the five years between 1881 and 1886, Sri Ramakrishna trained Rakal. He had many spiritual experiences including Samadhi. After the master's passing, Rakal renounced the world and took monastic vows with his brother disciples and became Swami Brahmananda. Swami Vivekananda called him Raja because of Sri Ramakrishna's assessment of his intelligence. And he was later known within the Ramakrishna order as Maharaj, or Great King. From late 1889 to 1895, Swami Brahmananda lived the life of an itinerant monk and practiced severe spiritual disciplines. Most of the time he was with one of his brother disciples at the insistence of Holy Mother and Swami Vivekananda. Why? He was too precious to be left on his own. Someone should be there to look after him and beg food for him if he became too absorbed in meditation and too unmindful of the world, knowing that this was his tendency not to dwell in this world, but in the higher realm. They made sure that he was properly taken care of. Okay, you can go out, but <laughs> we're going to shadow you. While in Om Karnath on the river Narmada, Swami Brahmananda was once in Samadhi for six days without a break. While he and Swami Subodhananda were at Vrindavan, one of Sri Ramakrishna's admirers, Vijay Krishna Goswami, asked him. He said, Rakal, Sri Ramakrishna gave you everything covetable in spiritual life. Visions of every god and goddess that you can imagine and samadhi itself. Why then 
Why then do you behave like a beggar? Why are you practicing so much austerity? You already have attained that which austerity brings. Brahmananda humbly answered, the experiences and visions that I got by the grace of Sri Ramakrishna, I'm now trying to attain as my permanent possession. Hmm? It's a different, there's a difference between being lifted up several orders of magnitude to, where, to a, a height that you couldn't attain on your own and walking that path yourself. He was walking that path himself so that he would be established in that realm and also so that he would be able to do for others something like what Sri Ramakrishna did for him. In 1895, he returned to Calcutta. His six years of wandering had been years of great spiritual growth. And on his return, everyone was amazed to see his shiny face just beaming with indescribable joy. He had become also very calm and grave. The boyish youth who had gone out traveling in 1889 returned a mature man, vitally changed, steadfast, stalwart, enduring, self-reliant, master of innumerable spiritual experiences. He was now well established within himself. And he was now qualified with a little more training and experience to rule both a spiritual and a material kingdom. Swami Vivekananda handed over responsibility of the fledgling Ramakrishna movement to mainly Swami Brahmananda and Swami Saradananda, and you could say Swami Premananda also, before he died. Swami Vivekananda had tremendous faith in Swami Brahmananda's judgment and loyalty. He said, others may desert me, but Raja, will stand by me till the last. When Swami Vivekananda passed away, Swami Brahmananda cried like a child over his body. He said as Swami Sardananda lifted him up, it is as if the entire Himalayan mountain range has disappeared from before my eyes. So, we'll move now to reminiscences of Swami Brahmananda. And in these, he'll be referred to uh, as Swami Brahmananda or Maharaj interchangeably, depending on the context, sometimes Raja, sometimes Raja Maharaj. And the first reminiscence uh, deals with this relationship between Swami Brahmananda and Swami Vivekananda. It's by Swami Vigyanananda, another direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, who is himself an illumined soul. So when illumined souls have this reverence and respect for other illumined souls, you want to perk up your ears and pay attention what's going on. Anyone coming into the orbit of Swami Vivekananda and Maharaj could feel a special spiritual atmosphere. Whosoever entered into that orbit could feel at once a power, an uplifting power permeating him or her. Now he's speaking as a knower of Brahman. <laughs> Swamiji loved us, his brother monks, intensely. It was like a mother's love for her child. And so he could not brook faults or defects in any of us. He wanted his brothers to be as great as he, no, even greater. But he had a very special love for Maharaj and respect for him. There is a saying, the guru's son is to be respected as the guru himself. 
And this was Swamiji's attitude towards Swami Brahmananda. I lived in the shade of Maharaja's protection. And so I did not receive much of Swamiji's scolding. One time I did not get the meaning of something Swamiji had said and flatly contradicted him. No, revered sir, you've not understood the ancient sages and seers. I saw Swamiji's face getting red, starting with the ears. <laughs> Maharaj was nearby walking back and forth near us. Swamiji said, Raja, look here. This fellow Peshan says I don't understand anything. Maharaj said, oh, brother, you shouldn't take anything seriously that he says. He's just a boy. <laughs> what does he know? Swamiji immediately calmed down. He accepted Maharaja's words as if he himself were a child, and Swamiji and I were reconciled. So, gone. Because Swamiji loved Maharaj with such intensity, he once scolded him so vehemently that Swami Brahmananda went to his room and wept copiously. In brackets. I must mention that the fault was mine. In order to shield me, Maharaj took the blame upon himself. When Swamiji learned that Maharaj was weeping, he became so upset that he rushed into Maharaj's room and after embracing him, started weeping as well. Raja, Raja, brother, please forgive me. How wrong I was to have scolded you. Seeing Swamiji crying, Maharaj was struck with wonder and said, well, you've scolded me. You're our leader. What of it? You only scolded me because you loved me. Swamiji again embraced Maharaj and said over and over, brother, please forgive me. Our master, loved you so much, he never spoke a harsh word to you. And over some trifling matter, look what I've done. So Amaji spoke like this for a long time. And, <coughs> and then, <coughs> excuse me, then they both became calm. I'll never forget that experience. I've seen with my own eyes what powerful attraction these two great souls Maharaj and Swamiji had for each other and for spiritual aspirants. People could not help but be drawn to them. The next remembrance is from Swami Bhuteshananda who became the 12th president of the Ramakrishna order. He visited St. Louis and stayed five days here in 1988 when he was still vice president. When I met Swami Brahmananda Ji, Swami Brahmananda Ji, I was a high school student of 16. I first visited Belur Mat in the year 1917. That means I could meet Maharaj off and on for five years only until his passing in 1922. At that time, because of my immaturity, I did not have sufficient courage to ask him questions. He appeared to me to be too big a personality to be approached on intimate terms. He was, of course, kind to all of us and particularly to us youngsters. We seldom saw him engaged in abstract religious discussion. He used to mix with us youngsters as if he was one of us. He would joke with us and make everyone laugh. We were always aware that this simple, 
fun-loving Swami who is making himself so easily available to us was no ordinary person. We knew that it was a rare privilege to be able to sit at his feet and listen to whatever he said. He was very fond of speaking in a light vein most of the time, and this appeared somewhat strange to newcomers. I'll give one example. One day, Atul Babu, that is the younger brother of Girish Chandra Ghosh, brought a friend with him specifically for the purpose of introducing him to Swami Brahmananda. The friend had heard a lot about the spiritual greatness of Maharaj. Unfortunately, though, throughout the time that they were present, Maharaj was speaking on light, humorous subjects. Atul Babu felt a bit embarrassed and also a bit anxious, wondering what impression his distinguished friend would carry home. Anyway, as they were leaving, Maharaj very casually said to Atul's friend, uh, you see, you see, sir, occasionally we also speak about religion. Later that day, his friend told Atul, today for the first time, <clears throat> for the first time in my life, I've met a person who's filled with pure joy. Maharaj carried that atmosphere with him wherever he was. This was his way. One could never know what his approach would be towards a newcomer. Some, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then he goes on to tell a, a, an incident that he heard from one of uh, Swami Brahmananda's attendants. Swami Brahmanandaji had great attraction for Bhubaneswar, a place that he considered highly conducive to spiritual practice. So he started a monastery there. And in those early days at Bhubaneswar, Maharaj spent most of his time in deep meditation. This is the incident that I heard from his attendants. There was a hotel nearby where, where pilgrims from different parts of India stayed whenever they visited Bhubaneswar. Not everyone came for pilgrimage. Many came for sightseeing or to just be in a quiet little town away from the big city. <laughs> it seems three young men from Calcutta were staying at the hotel and they asked the manager about tourist destinations. He mentioned the, name of the names of the prominent temples and then told the young men that they could also visit in the town, a branch of the Ramakrishna order. Then he shared with them the local gossip. He said, quote, the head of the monastery, meaning Swami Brahmananda, lives in a princely style. His hookah is made of gold, and the monastery has an enormous campus. The young men said, why, that's outrageous that a monk who's supposed to be penniless should live in such luxury. Why don't people teach him a lesson? The hotel manager replied, oh my God, that's unthinkable. All the big guns go there and visit him. I don't have the courage to say anything in criticism of the Swami. All right then, the young men said, we're not afraid of anybody. We shall go ourselves and teach him a lesson. Meanwhile, at the monastery, Swami Brahmananda was sitting in the parlor with his attendants. It looked to them as if he was expecting someone. He told his attendants not to disturb him when the visitors came. Indeed, after a few minutes, the three young men arrived. They were taken into Maharaja's room, offered seats, and the attendants came away, closing the doors behind them. What exactly happened inside the room, the attendants 
didn't know. They only heard peals of laughter. After some time, the young men took leave of Swami Brahmananda and returned to their hotel. The manager, curious, asked them how they found the princely Swami. They replied as one, for the first time in our lives, we've seen a really great man. He exudes love, sympathy, and understanding. It was the experience of a lifetime. You see what Swami Brahmananda appreciated was sincerity. That's what he told his disciples. Sincerity and truthfulness are the most important things in spiritual life. And sincerity is more important. So they came to him with pure intention. It wasn't very well directed, but it was, it was pure. And, and, and he, he, he didn't take offense, you see. He didn't take it personally at all. And they went away with this understanding. <clears throat> this was typical of Swami Brahmananda. He sometimes impressed people by his mere silence, sometimes through amusing talk. And when he chose to do so, though rarely, through his spiritual teaching. Whatever might be the contents of Maharaja's conversation, everyone who met him carried a deep impression of his spiritual personality. So when we went to him as boys, we did not have the courage to ask questions, but just seeing him was enough. That gave us enough fulfillment and joy. It was enough to fill our minds and hearts with love and respect for him. And these have remained with us undiminished throughout our lives. So, so we're going to move on to Swami Gyanatmananda, who first met Swami Brahmananda in 1918. And he talks about his interaction with Swami Brahmananda at Bellarmat as a novice. Now, in the morning, uh, the novices would go and sit outside Swami Brahmananda's room, uh, and he, he would meditate with them. Uh, and it was just the novices. But in the evening, that's what he's describing here, in the evening when the services at the temple were over, we again assembled before Maharaj, but this time we were not alone. Joining us were Swamis Shivananda, Abedananda, Vigyanananda, and sometimes Saradananda when he was at Belarmat, as well as other senior monks like Swami Atmananda and Swami Shuddhananda. Some of them took their seats on chairs while others sat on the floor with us. They all came to joy, enjoy the divine company of Maharaj and to his, listen to his conversation. Maharaj would sit silent for some time and then ask us to put some questions to the Swamis who were present to remove doubts that we might have. As we often felt shy to do so, Maharaj himself would frame some questions on our behalf and told us to put them first to Swami Vigyanananda. We remember how, with much hesitation and reverence, Swami Vigyanananda would answer. Then Maharaj would have us put the same question to the other Swamis, one after another. In this way, the, tr the question traveled from one Swami to another until it finally came back to Maharaj, who expressed the last opinion. It was as if we were getting only glimpses of the truth until then. And then with Maharaj, we received, we received the whole picture. On one occasion, Maharaj told us to ask, 
what would be the state of mind of a mind after it had realized God? All the senior monks answered the question in a different way, and each answer was illuminating. And most of them were speaking from their own experience. I mean, we're talking about a bunch of realized souls here. Finally, it came back to Maharaj, and he said, why don't you just cite the Upanishadic verse where it states, when one sees him who is both far and near, all the knots of the heart are cut asunder, all doubts vanish, and all karmas, past, present, and future, no longer have any effect on him. And this, we thought, was the fullest answer. But you see the genius of the technique. I mean, here are all these realized souls. If Maharaj dominates the conversation, what are they going to remember? They'll just have the answer, but they won't have a chance to think about it. But if they, they go around the circle and they get the light that each Swami shines on it, then they'll be thinking about it in a much more comprehensive way so that when they get to Maharaj, the minds are ready to receive it. They're prepared to receive it. So they get the full benefit of the entire spectrum, this, this, this part, this part expressed, and then the whole synthesis. It's a very uh, remarkably modern uh, teaching technique that, that he used for these novices. And, I mean, what a way to learn spiritual life. <laughs> now, because of the enthusiasm that we novices had uh, to be near uh, Maharaj as much as we could, uh, some of us became a little negligent in our allotted duties. And this was reported to Swami Shudananda who is the assistant secretary of the organization. Now his nature was one of sweetness and helpfulness, but when this was reported, he, came, he became irritated. One evening when we were all sitting with Maharaj and enjoying his conversation, Swami Shuddhananda hurried over to us. Maharaj, he said, these novices often come to you and pass a great deal of time in your holy association, but the work of the Mat is suffering. The monastery is suffering. If things go on this way, it will be difficult to carry on the regular work of this, of this institution. Kindly permit us to expel these boys whom we find to be negligent. And he added after a pause, and also Maharaj, please do not give them your protection. Maharaj was visibly moved by the last words. What are you saying, Shudir? These boys have left their homes to realize God. Do you ever ask how far they're progressing towards that highest goal? Have you ever asked at any time how long they sit each day for meditation and japa? You talk of work. How will they be able to make any progress? If you speak of work only and don't help them towards their goal with your own experience. At this, one of the senior monks present said rather lightly that these boys were far too wise to require any guidance from their seniors. Maharaj got more heated and said to this monk, Brother, you see, he's. He's, 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 he's starting to scold him, but he, but he calls him brother. <laughs> brother, how little they know. They're fresh from their homes, have, no pra have practically no knowledge of what japa and meditation mean. I see that many of them do not sit at all for it, and only a few attend the evening services. Is that enough for them? Brother, if we, don't, if we want to receive anything from these boys, 
we must give them something. Otherwise, why have they come to us? Just see how many of these young monks are running to Varanasi to wait on and serve Swami Turinanda, who lies there sick. It's only because they know they'll get something substantial from him. Here, they get almost nothing. Then turning back to Swami Shuddhananda, Maharaj said, Well, Shudhir, you ask permission from me to drive these boys away. That you may do. But my door will always be open to them. I will not be able to turn any of them away. You speak of work alone, but I see that some of these boys, at least, will solely devote themselves to tapasya and meditation for all their days, and we need monks like that too. We novices were struck with awe and reverence when we heard these words from Maharaj and were overwhelmed by the deep and unselfish love that he cherished for us. I mean, they could feel it, but they'd never heard it expressed like that. He continues, many years after this, we had gone to Kankal uh, near Hardwar, and there the founder of the ashram, the revered Kalyan Maharaj, Swami Kalyanananda, a disciple of Swami Vivekananda, asked those of us who had seen Sri Sri Maharaj to say something about him on the day of his birth. In the course of conversation, when the topic of Varanasi and others was raised, now uh, Maharaj went to Varanasi at least once to solve a problem uh, in the uh, monastery that was beyond the scope of the other direct disciples. He was dragged there by Swami Saradananda. And he solved it, but in his own way. Uh, in the course of conversation, when the topic of Varanasi was raised, I said lightly, Maharaj was very clever. At this, Kalyan Maharaj was annoyed. He said, how much, how much of Raja Maharaj have you understood, my young man? Did you say he was clever? Vivekananda was like the very sun. None of us could get near him. And Maharaj was like the moon. All of us would feel satisfied in his cooling light. We used to obey him, not only because he was president of the order, but because each of us knew that whatever he was asking of us would really be for our good. That's why we used to obey him without a murmur, not because he was intelligent or clever. Hearing these words from Kalyan Maharaj, we were charmed to the very core. We understood that this was the real estimate of Swami Brahmananda. And that reminds me of something that um, Swami Satprakashananda said here in 1968 um, on the 105th birth anniversary of Swami Brahmananda. <clears throat> He's talking about Swami Brahmananda and his leadership style. He says, Swami Brahmananda would never sacrifice the development of any monastic member for the development of the organization. He would always watch. Whenever Swami Brahmananda delegated any work, he would first consider the spiritual interest of the worker. 
It may be good for the work, but if that work was not congenial to the spiritual development of the monastic member, Swami Ramananda would not send him. He held the view that it is the right type of men and women that are the material for building an organization. Without the right type of people, an organization can never serve as an uplifting spiritual force. You can have gorgeous buildings and big hospitals, but without, but without spiritual, unselfish, capable men and women, the general population won't be benefited spiritually. If you have the right type of people, everything will fall into line and be in order. So I go back to Swami Gyaratmananda's reminiscences. Swami, uh, Swami Brahmananda's sense of fun came from a very deep source. It came from the Ananda in Brahmananda. And it just sp spilled out of him. And he's trying to uh, express that here before he wraps up. My reminiscences would not be complete, complete unless I cited some instances of Maharaja's humor. For instance, he used to call many devotees by nicknames. One old man he called Abdul, a Muslim name, though the gentleman was an out-and-out -out Hindu, only because he had a long white beard. <clears throat> Another gentleman with a big imposing mustache was called Kaiser because he looked a little like Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany. He referred to a pot-bellied short man as Lat Pot Jawan, which means a wrestler. Though this pot-bellied short man was out of shape and knew nothing of wrestling. This last gentleman was much favored by Maharaj. By profession, he was a tailor and had little education. But because of his simplicity, Maharaj loved him. And when he came to the Mat, Maharaj would often make jokes and fun at his expense and with him. Once Maharaj encouraged him to imitate a drum by using his mouth. Latpat at once obliged, and his antics soon had Maharaj and the rest of us rolling with laughter. Another time, Maharaj casually told Latpat to roll on the lawn in front of the monastery until he reached the Ganga, the Ganges River. And without one moment's hesitation, Latpat began rolling towards the river. Somehow, Mar Maharaj managed to stop him, lest he should fall off the embankment and into the river. Latpat, however, was quite unperturbed. We all enjoyed the fun, but were in ignorance of the spirit which prompted him. One day, one of us asked, Latpat, you come here. You must come here to receive the benefit from Maharaja's spiritual presence and advice. Then why do you simply make a buffoon of yourself before him in all these ways? Latpat was almost in tears. His eyes teared up. And he said, brothers, I can't follow everything that you say. I'm illiterate and poor, and I can't follow all of the conversation. Yet, Maharaj loves me. I can give nothing to Maharaj, but I feel myself blessed if Maharaj receives even a little pleasure from my childish behavior.
you know, there's all gradations of society would come to them. They'd all be this melting, this mixing pot, you know. And he knew how to reach each person where they were. And this is how he reached this gentleman whose name we don't know. We only know his nickname. The next reminiscence is from Swami Shambhavananda, who was from South India and a very distinguished, uh, did you know him? No. Yeah, very distinguished uh, Swami of our order. Uh, he saw Swami Brahmananda in Bangalore in 1920 and received initiation from him there. I joined the order in 1920 at Bangalore at the age of 26. Hence, I was present at the ashram as a probationer when Maharaj came, and I'm grateful for those three months. This was my first and last meeting with Swami Brahmananda. He traveled with a very large retinue, and in anticipation of his coming, the party, and, and, and with his party, we had to make ad, advance, extensive ad, advance arrangements, and much of the work fell to me and another brahmachari. I'll never forget Maharaja's arrival and my first impression. I could only think as he alighted from the carriage that brought him from the railroad station. There is a prince in our portico. Swami Nirmalananda introduced me. This is our new novice. As Maharaj looked at me, I could even then sense the affection with which he regarded everyone. I was to enjoy that affection in great measure in the weeks that followed. For each morning when I went into his room to make pranams, I was the recipient of such love as I had previously received only from my mother. He often spoke to me as if I were his own child. Sometimes he would give me little tasks. In a very appealing manner, he would sweetly say, would you please close the window? I would be so touched. Why should such an exalted being be so sweet to me? I would reply, my heart melting, Maharaj, but why do you say please? <laughs> he expressed appreciation for the smallest service that I might do for him. Love just poured from him. And if you came near Maharaj, you couldn't help but be showered with his love. And each associate of Swami Brahmananda felt that he was loved the most. Each felt that he was on particularly intimate terms with Maharaj. Animals equally responded to Maharaja's love. At the ashram, there was a beautiful and pleasing dog named Jockey. Maharaj loved Jockey, and at the end of his meal, he'd take morsels from his plate and give the food to Jockey, calling, Jockey, Jockey, Jockey. Maharaj would feed the dog. It was difficult at these times to tell which of them was happier. <laughs> Maharaja's affection for Jockey and Jockey's affection for Maharaj was a sight to see. The last reminiscence is from Dilip Kumar Roy, who was introduced to Swami Brahmananda as a young man by his maternal grandfather, Pratap Chandra Majumdar a homeopathic doctor who had treated Sri Ramakrishna during his last illness. In 1913, just as I had matriculated to college, my father died, leaving me a large income. His mother had died earlier. My maternal grandfather, who was a millionaire, took me under his wing. 
I was just 16. I graduated from college in 1918 and decided to go to England for higher studies. I had by this time acquired a fair mastery of our classical music, which I came to love passionately, to the dismay of my sedate Victorian grandfather, who held that music was disturbing if not downright dangerous. But I ignored him and went on singing everywhere until I became almost famous while still in my teens. Because of this, many a father began besieging my grandparents with, who pressed me to get married before sailing for Europe. Meanwhile, I had taken a secret vow to stay celibate all my life, though, even, though very few even among my friends knew of it. One of my confidants and classmates Shubhash Chandra Bosch had also taken a similar vow, for, but for different reasons. And I shared, I shared, I, we were close friends, and, I, and we shared our, our uh, <clears throat> commitments with each other. But my grandfather, who knew nothing of all this, pressed me to marry a rich heiress. What he dreaded as a conservative Hindu was that I should fall for a European girl. As I persisted in negating every proposal that arrived, he asked me to go with him to Swami Brahmananda in order to get me straightened out and receive the protection of his blessing. Besides, as he had treated Sri Ramakrishna as a physician when he was suffering from cancer, he knew something of the power of yogis. He knew personally a good many of the direct disciples of the great master and notably Swami Brahmananda, whom he venerated as a great saint. I was overjoyed. <laughs> I'd read up all there was to be read about Swami Brahmananda, who Sri Ramakrishna called his spiritual son. But my grandfather, never having been my confidant, didn't know that since my boyhood, I had been an ardent admirer of this great monk. But my joy gave way to palpitation as we entered the house of Balaram Bosch, where Swami Brahmananda was staying at the time. He was at that time the head of the Ramakrishna Mott and Mission and was worshiped by thousands as a shining example of how a yogi should behave and live, dominating like a king and yet not bound by his kingdom. Such was the man I was about to meet. Blessed am I, said my young soul. As we entered the room, Swami Brahmananda was on the, on the living room of the first floor. The great yogi, in an overcolored robe, turned and greeted us with a simple smile. Oh, Pratap Babu, he said. This is indeed delightful. The two old friends talked for a while in great joy, after which I was duly presented. But then, alas, my trial began, for my grandfather at once started complaining of me and went on volubly for some minutes. After having given Swami all the enlightenment he needed about the defects of my character and antecedents, my grandfather may have felt that he had perhaps overdone it. But he's not a bad boy, and I will say this for him, he's rather good at his studies, and has passed this year with first class honors in mathematics, but I am worried, Swamiji. You see, his father has left him fairly, a fairly large fortune, and he is already 21, so there's no holding him. He's an adult. Besides, he is, as you can see for yourself, a handsome boy, but the trouble is, Swami, he's downright ornery by nature and temperamental and impulsive and modern. That's the worst of it, modern. He simply refuses to marry. God knows why. Though several beautiful brides are in the offing, one of whom has a considerable dowry from the bargain, but he shook his head dolefully. He's obstinate as a mule and simply refuses to get in line. 
An amused smile edged Maharaja's lips. Indeed. Then he looked appraisingly at me for a while. I felt the blood mounting to my temples when he turned towards my crestfallen guardian. I quite understand, Pratap Babu, but what is it that you expect me to do? Surely, you don't expect me to coax him into marrying, being what I happen to be. <laughs> but he said, why not leave it to the boy? I would do that willingly, Swami. Only the trouble is, he insists on proceeding at once to England, and I am, well, afraid. Don't you see? He is a rather impetuous fellow, and he has plenty of money, and you know, perhaps you don't know, but I know how quickly things come to a head there. He'll march straight into some snare and will come back with an English girl, all painted and rouged. And that will be the end of everything. Sheer ruin, I predict. So I told the boy, since you're so pig-headed, at least come with me to a great saint. Let us at least have his blessings by way of protection so that you make the best of a bad bargain. And oh, yes, I forgot to tell you, he added ruefully. He happens to be a musician. Simply sings and sings and sings. And you don't know how dangerous that is when young girls are around. Grandpa was cut short by Maharaj. You sing, my boy? Why? How very nice. Won't you sing something for us? A song about the Divine Mother. I mean, do you know any? I was overjoyed and chose a song by Kamala Kanta on Kali that Sri Ramakrishna used to love to sing. As I sang, Maharaja's face became transformed, almost self-luminous. Then he lost outer consciousness altogether and passed into samadhi. I went on singing, my eyes fastened on his luminous face till I could see no more through my unshed tears. When I paused at the end of my song, peace had descended upon to, in, peace had descended into me, a deep peace which seemed to fill the interstices of my being. I felt with a vividness I do not know how to describe that while I had been singing, he had blessed me. We waited in silence till he came back to outward consciousness. Then he looked intently at me without speaking. I lowered my eyes, withal slightly embarrassed under his steadfast scrutiny. He turned towards my grandfather and with a beautiful smile said, Pratap Babu, have no misgivings. He will come to no harm abroad. My grand grandfather stared uncomprehendingly. <laughs> Maharaj smiled again. Do you know what I saw while he was singing? I saw an aura of protection around the boy, Takur's aura, which is an armor. I tell you, and I know. So let him go where he will. He will come back unscathed. He may indeed stumble, but I tell you, he will not fall. Then turning his face to me, he said, come, my boy, come near. I could hold myself in no more, and resting my head on his feet as tears of joy and gratitude found an outlet at last. <laughs> he stroked my head and neck gently. The touch of his palm soothed my entire being as a cool current of deep peace coursed down from the crown of my head to my navel. When I lifted my eyes to his, he was still gazing tenderly. I stammered, won't you, won't you give me some advice? He held my eyes for a few more seconds till a gentle smile trembled on his lips. 
only one thing, his voice hardly above a whisper, remember, always. Remember? He nodded, yes. That is what Sri Ramakrishna used to tell us so often, smaran manam, remember constantly. That is the essence of yoga. And remember his grace, Thakur's grace, and keep reminding yourself, say to yourself, I have received his grace and I must be worthy of it. And then all will be well. This is the only advice he gave me and these words are etched forever on the tablet of my heart. This is his reminiscence from 1954. So. Oh my. So I'll close with a prayer. <clears throat> oh. Purnaisya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 This ever-changing interdependent universe of things and beings is infinite. That self-existent unchanging spiritual reality is infinite. This ever-changing universe coming from that unchanging reality, that reality remains undivided, unchanged, perfect, complete, infinite. Peace, peace, 